queríamos disculpar que, que Hello. As you know, we have a little delay and I wanted to apologize uh, for this. Uh, we're sorry, especially for those who are here on time and you're suffering from these delays. So re we're really sorry, we would like to apologize for this, but we're going to start in just like five minutes. We've got 15 minute delay since this morning and we're going to start at uh, quarter two. So, sorry. We will be with you in a minute. Tenemos que empezar ya. ¿Eh? Sí. Mucha. Cerrada por. Bueno, sí. Muy buenas tardes. Eh, vamos a arrancar esta so, good afternoon. sesión de la tarde. Que We're going to start this afternoon session. It seems like a bit difficult to launch, but 
Tiene muchísimo sentido arrancar esta tarde con We hope con este diálogo. You're going to enjoy it. It's uh, very important for us to start this afternoon session with this dialogue. So we're working around this sentence by Camus, art cannot be a monologue. We've seen three creators this morning who use different tools and uh, use them in the reality and go into the in their inner self to start a dialogue with the rest of the world. And this afternoon, for me, it was essential to articulate this dialogue from one art to the other. And we have here with us two people, as you can see, but we've got a connection with Luis González Palma. Hello, Luis, from Argentina. Thank you so much for being with us in these trovades. Thank you for being here this year that is so difficult. And this is the reality we are in. We are in this uh, typical room with the audience and with uh, one of the participants of the dialogue who is in Argentina couldn't come all the way to Minorca, but we wanted him to participate in this conservation, in this con conversation. In this dialogue, from one art to the other, because we have Alejandro Castellote, who is a commissioner of photography, who started working in the, f in the field of images many years ago. And the fixed form of photographers. And here we have two artists also with very different trajectories and universes who are going to create a dialogue from one art to the other. They have a need to build their narrative, their writing using several arts to um, feed their creation. And I would like to leave you with them. You have this afternoon for you. You have an hour and a half for the discussion. Thank you. Bueno, muy buenas tardes. Es, eh, iba a decir que es un... Hello, good afternoon. It is a pleasure and it's really exciting to be here with you. Being with you is one of the uh, things we most wished we could come back to participate with people, to enjoy with culture, learn, and to be together with other people, enjoy this space that enriches us so much. We miss Luis very much. These are the circumstances we are living and there. They also are in the same situation. As you can see in Argentina, it's winter. It's snowing a lot in Córdoba. And well, I'd like to start with something else. John and Luis are friends of mine. And this means I have a special relationship with them. And it also means that this conversation is going to be very easy. Luis was born in Guatemala, in um, Central America, in 57. But he moved to Córdoba, the province in uh, Argentina, in 2001. He gave me a very neutral CV. There are personal exhibitions, the art Institute in Chicago, the Lennon Foundation in Santa Fe in the US too, the Australian Center of Photography in Australia, the Palace of Beaux Arts in Mexico, the Royal Festival in London, the Palazzo Ducane di Genova in Italy, the Macro and Castagnino Museums in Rosario in Argentina, and he's participated in festivals such as Photofest in Bratis the one in Bratislava, also meetings in France, Photo España in Madrid, Singapore, International Photography Festival in San Pablo, 
Caracas, Sao Paulo, is in fact Sao Paulo. In Brazil, he's participated in the 49 uh, exhibition, also in the Photo Biennial in Vigo, in Brazil, also in the Habana, Havana Biennial in Germany, in the Taipei Art Museum, in Korea, in Taiwan, in the Museum of Bozart, in Buenos Aires, in Argentina, in Zurich, also in the Palace of Conde Duque, in of Madrid, and also in Stockholm. And he's got many pieces of works in many different exhibitions all over the world. And John is going to give me his CV on his phone. <laughs> Here I have it. John was born in 1978 in San Sebastian. He studied economy and he's also an artist, um, art photographer. He goes from the intimate world and incorporates signs and symbols that are uh, ancestral and brings them into the contemporary art. He's a synthetic artist. He searches for knowledge through introspective questioning with the final purpose of a better understanding the surrounding context. Since 2007 till 2019, he worked in the Calerna project he pub that he published in 2020 with Edition Xavier Barrar in France, one of the most important publishers in photography, and also in Dalpin, which is a web and publisher and distributor of books. He's exhibited in public and private institutions like the Canal de Isabel II in Madrid, Caixa Forum, Tabacalera in San Sebastian, also in Cibeles in Madrid, the Museum Jorge Oteiza that we will also visit in the Wandong Museum of Art within the in a triennial one show in Wanchou, in China, in Belvedere Museum, in the Netherlands, in the Albedere Museum in Belgium. And he's also participated in many other international meetings like the Arles meetings, also in the photo festival in the Netherlands, in the Biennial in um, Southern America, in Photo Mexico and Photo España. Here you are. So, before we start, I'm going to explain how we're going to do this. Luis is in Cordoba, so we're going to present his works and he's going to comment on this. And we're going to show the, his works from here, from San Juan. And then John will also show us uh, his works very briefly. And then during the conversation, we're going to go back to some of those images so that we can explain some of the processes and give some additional details. We were hurrying up, but I'd like to start thanking the town council of San Juiz for uh, deciding on organizing this edition that is so important for all of us. I'd like to thank Sandra Mon Monarch and all the whole team for having launched the Drobades with all the many problems and difficulties we all had to face. And we're really excited to be here, to participate, and to spend this time with Jan and Luis. And I wanted to start with a quote from a philosopher that I like very much, Emilio Bedoc, who says, the learning of freedom constitutes the memory of what we are. Human beings are what we are because of language, because of the possibility to communicate love and friendship. That world of sensibility has no code in, the, as, in opposition to language. And I would add to this, to love and friendship, 
um, art creation, artistic creation that has no code. There's this commonplace that says that photography is a universal language because it can be understood by everybody. And the three of us, we don't agree with this idea of uh, photography being our uh, language. Lang uh, language is because we, uh, this is a social agreement that when we say table, we're referring to this. But in photography, that is not the case. We're all supposed to understand photography, but in fact, one of the most important aspects um, of understanding a picture is our point of view, where, from where we're looking at that picture, what is our collective imaginary, what is its geographical position, our mood, our previous individual experiences. And this is why something that as simple as a photography that is just a piece of paper, in fact, can provoke um, or make a mother cry when looking at the picture of her son, or making us feel sick if we are over 90 and we think about the Spanish Civil War. So photographies, pictures have this quality of being a switch for memory. We look at them differently. We each see different things in those photographs because they go beyond the filters of subjectivity. They go through those filters. And then we start from this, uh, we, we have to work over this stereotype of photography as being something that can be understood by all. I think Luis can see me, can't you? He's through that camera, right? So uh, Luis, do you have your sound? Can you speak? Luis, please, Luis, let me know when you want us to view your images. Just let me know. I will be doing that. Well, thank you very much. First of all, I'd like to, yes, thank you for your invitation. I'm really, truly deep that I cannot be there with you. I'm going to be very brief because, in fact, I said that I wanted to dedicate the time for showing the images to, in fact, create the dialogue. So I'm going to be very quick. I'm going to try to take about 10 minutes for the images. And yes, that's good, because that way, afterwards, we can go back to any of the, your images so that we can talk about some of those details. I also have a few videos um, that show his exhibitions, and these will help us illustrate the conversation. So, Luis, I can start with the first picture. These images belong to the beginning of what I did in 89. Can we see the next picture, please? Yes, without the lights, it's better. Next, please. Very briefly, I like to talk about my con the context because the context of childhood is key. I think the primary experiences, the first experiences, will mark the way we see the world. And these images that we are seeing, uh, the result of a reflection of what I went through at the beginning. I have to guess because I cannot see the image now. Okay. The lights are <laughs> off and therefore I cannot see the images. It says the critical look this is a paradigm in the sense that everything that I had been working on previously was linked to political and social aspects, also poetic, 
aspects and everything that was referred to as the magic realism in Latin American literature. And with this critical look, I try to abandon those decorative elements related to nature to try to think about how I look towards the other, my, how I position myself there, and also to work on the perception, not only with regards to photography, but in general too. Time Out belongs to that same series. All these images were linked to that. With this process of trying to understand how we perceive the other, how we perceive the world. I was born in 1957, and in 1960, the armed conflict in started off in Guatemala, and it lasted uh, for 30 years. So I lived in a country where we, where we felt a lot of fear, and violence was something that marked me and also the way I understand the relationship with others. Uh, also the violence that is was a subtle violence that was present at the time. This picture dates from 2003-2004. That was my first project in Argentina, a very oniric project marked by the psychoanalytic thought that I find very interesting. This series here, and then next one, next one. This was the beginning of projects that I started to carry out in Argentina. And then, the next project on the mind, I think this is essential in my work because this is when I started eliminating part of the image with a purpose. This is the sheet of Christ and I think you can read that. It's Zurbaran, this one, I think Greco was the other one. And the, here I did these sculptures with tissue, copying this pain sheet of Christ of when he was crucified and leaving that absence there. I only have three minutes left. I don't want you to hurry up. It's not that. I'm not hurrying you up. These are other images, annunciation. This is a project. This is a color project, and I hadn't used that earlier. Well, you know, I could spend hours talking about each of my projects, but I rather enjoyed the dialogue. This was uh, commissioned by the Town Council of Madrid. It was a project on the city of Madrid, and we can discuss that later on if you want. This is autonomously, you know. This is a series that goes your look is giving me away. It's from Guatemala, and well, it's a very complex topic. They need to carry out a project based on social phenomena was something that's very important for me. And it 
was printed. And as Alejandro said, I've tried to work out of the box to come out of a rigid concept of photography. And I've carried out projects that have hardly much, well, not much to do with photography, like this one here. This was the copper extracted from the lightning cables of a house. And then I build these structures, this light candle, and then my teeth too. And then I get my teeth also made um, a sculpture of teeth out of white chocolate, and this was given to people who could eat it. So it's an expression of how the artist makes uh, his work out of his body, and it is consumed by others. Well, I'm sorry, but this uh, device is just jumping the pictures on its own. I only have one minute left, but I would, would like to jump over this, and I'd like to refer to another Serious. Here, for example, this one. The previous one? The previous one? I'd like to finish with this, in fact. Because I'd like to, you know, enjoy the dialogue more than focus on the images. So I would like to spend more time on the dialogue. But this project was carried out in Guatemala. It's called the NECA project. And in the background, you have the National Palace. So I took a picture of the National Palace and then. I invited people to take a picture in the square so with the palace the, the picture of the palace in the back instead of the actual palace and this was the game of the representation I had been working on portraits for a long time and I wanted to do portraits again, but in a different way, you know, not this religiously loaded mm, portrait with those shades that we had in the future, in the in the past. And now I wanted to do a different kind of portrait. So I think that we can stop it there, if you agree, Alejandro, and then we can do something else and go back to this later. We're going to do the same thing with John. But this time you can hold this uh, device so that you can enjoy it, all this skipping of the images. Hola, vamos a poner la proyección de John. All right, let's see now John's projection. Muy buenas tardes, yo soy John Cazenave. All right, my name is John Casanave. I would like to say some words in Catalan. I'm from the Basque Country. I was born in the Basque Country. And I was thinking about all of this during my trip here. I was thinking about the dialogue of languages. So actually, I would like to thank the organizers for having uh, allowed for all of this with their team. Now, a great deal of my work is the result of the tension that was experienced in the Basque country since my childhood since 1968, and I wanted to symbolize this in this way. I wanted to, to pay tribute to Oteiza and Chillida. These are two sculptures that you will know. 
They were working on the same ideas, ideas related to void. In a similar way, on the left-hand side, you can see a metaphysical box, and it's quite a small sculpture. And here, we're being told that what matters is not the matter, but rather what the matter holds, that is, the void, this empty space. And this, in, in this other work uh, by Chiyida, Chiyida is reflecting about the same. We could feel the inside and the energy that the mountain um, generates. So these two artists symbolize what I feel over there. And uh, so you're either a follower of Patricia or a Chiyida. And I was born to be both Otisian and Chigidan. I think this is slow, isn't it? <laughs> At the beginning, I used this documental photography to analyze the political conflict, and these images stem from that time. As you can see, I use black and white with a lot of contrast. And this is not only aesthetic. Black and white, to me, is a way to make this clash between black and white. And the contrast between those is actually a response to, 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 to all the shades of gray, if you want. And actually, it shows how the conflict has been polarized. And this work starts to try to find uh, an issue to all of this. I started with images that were very close to photojournalism or documentary pictures. Anyway, I tried to use the aesthetic of clash. You can see here these images and how all this work is formalized. In this case, we're talking about the Rumania Agunea Kucha, organized by the Kucha Foundation in San Sebastian in 2020. I'll try to go a bit faster. <laughs> I don't know if this goes faster. <laughs> Maybe we can turn down the light a little bit. This immense black that really invades it all, and this pass towards uh, what's rural, towards what's traditional, this fusion between human beings and nature, leads me gradually to paths that are less corrupted by politics and violence and more inclined to myths. So this is a kind of shelter that I try to find. The myth is pure symbol. So this helps me to get away from that polluted environment so that I can end up analyzing the landscape, the landscape as a construction, the landscape very much related to photography, because landscape, after all, is just a territory that we see from a certain place with a certain heritage, with a certain, certain culture. And then there's also the possibility to start with this analysis of the homeland, or, you know, the fatherland and uh, in transition to the motherland. And this is the hole or the cave as an abstract remaining of, of a human being that has not yet been totally forgotten. It's still there. And here we're using this dialogue between the walls of the cave and the skin of my former girlfriend, Lourdes, the hand, it's the first selfie, isn't it? 
It's important. It's important to remember all this past. After the cave, I feel some kind of illumination and light is worth everything. And I feel that photography and art fulfills its purpose, its liberating purpose. And Alejandro was saying this as well. I started this project as a person from the Basque country, but I finish it just as a person that has been freed up from all that political burden that was so damaging. And I feel I feel that I owe to encounter and I feel that I owe to abstraction. I was saying that my images are black, but they're not as black as you can see in the projection, actually. They're being projected, highlighting the dark part. I would like also to say that I'm focusing more in natural aspects, in the atmosphere, the sea, the clouds, because sometimes the sea and the clouds can explain much, much more than what any book can tell. And here I am moving away from that idea of the great picture to give lots of information. And here I just move towards more graphic um, objects, like oriental objects, like a stain. And uh, we'll talk about this later on because I see that I'm taking longer. longer. And here, so far, we can see the image and the picture as, an, as, an, as a sculpture, as a sculptural object. And we can see here the image of the wall, and this is interesting. I'm talking about a sculptural object, but not a sculpture. I would like to say that I believe that these images are related differently when we uh, relate them in two dimensions or in volumes. And here, color. After 10 years of working intensely in black and white, we can see now color appears in the form of a pigment. And I incorporate that color, that pigment, to the pebbles that I get from the walks I make, from my hikes. It's just like, you know, incorporating landscape to the photography through that pigment. And all this crystallizes in an exhibition that you have seen and in a book that, as Alejandro was saying, was published by Dai Pine and Edition Xavier Barral with the support of many people. And then I move towards this other period more geometrical period with color. You see that color appears, and color is given by the matter and by the pigment that I can gather from the mountain. And here, I'm trying to find images that have a certain degree of openness. I feel cold, and I feel that I am being called. And uh, these images are completed with these pigments, and this adds up layers to the image. And then I focus in the pro process construction process of the image. These are phenotypes and uh, I use this, sorry, cyanotype, which is a, a salt so that the sea can represent its own image. And I'm open to more contemporary aspects. These are just screenshots of the sea and they're taken in the sea. And the formalization of these projects is quite different today. 
It's quite different from what you may have seen. These are open projects and they do not have a definite shape. But I would like to finish with this reflection, the scientific logic and the artistic logic. Scientific logic says that life or a career or a process is like a stairway to, to where you want to get. However, the artistic logic works in a different manner. It works in circles that we cover little by little. And if you're lucky enough in life, you will see that all those circles connect and they generate this complete flower. And when you light it up, I think that, well, you light it up and then it disappears so that you can start again. So it's a kind of sphere. And I think that we have already started here to get to this. Yeah, I was going to say that there's a certain consensus that art is in process. I've always been interested in asking artists, what is this moment that entangles the willingness to create something to be shared? Today we're talking about monologues, and I believe that there's a part in this creation process of artists, there's a kind of solipsism, and I, I found a definition that I love, and I love definitions actually. I love finding definitions. Solipsism. This is the thinking subject that cannot assert any other existence than its own. In other words, solipsism means that one focuses in its own world and everything which is uh, revolving around this cannot be real. But well, this could be like a moment, right? But this could also become something that can be shared, something that can be communicated. Because at the end of the day, uh, one of the essences of art is that art is sharing. I would like to repeat that question to Louise and to Jon so that we can move forward from their own processes and uh, what all of this unravels. I mean, this willingness to create, to, to commit to a certain project. Louise, well, basically, what rules here is the desire. If, if there's no desire, no wish to, for something, well, this, there would be nothing. And the wishing, this exists because something is far from our, understand, from our understanding. It's something that is difficult to grasp. It's like this kind of agreement with the world that I do not fully understand. And this leads me to try to find, to wish to find images that would complete that. And uh, images that would serve me, images that would serve the other. But I also feel that what we call creative process is something that, that comes from the desire to, to find. But, well, I cannot see this otherwise. It's just the fact of being attentive to those experiences which are, I think that I told you so. They are, and they help you build other worlds, other worlds that accompany you in your habitat and your own life. And this is like this. I wish to find and to be aware and attentive to the experience that I have of life. 
I wish to find something, I still don't know what it is, but when I perceive that something is shown to me, it's like a spark that starts generating and uh, something that will be a piece of work. Luis, you tell us very much about your relationship with psychoanalysis and image, this kind of, uh, of link between those two, psychoanalysis and images. And uh, sometimes you also refer to childhood and that need in childhood that is very well defined by you, the need to create a parallel world because the world that you have is not enough. And you say that this is a moment in your life in which you cannot do anything with your own words and with the little words that you have and the little experience that you have. So you must live longer so that as an adult you can untie all those knots that were tied and you know I was thinking about it all and then Luis told me when John came that well John would have a text that he would be reading later on hi Luis and I didn't even say hello now that we're starting to talk together I, what I was discussing that there's a text by a Brazilian geographer, Janner, which says that we're not building other spaces within spaces. What they do is they build another spatial reality in something in existence. So this is creations, right? It's marvelous. It's like something that's created. How do they understand about speciality? Yes, this all this world of childhood. There is a sentence that I thanked you for sending it, sending it to me. So it was a sort of a self quotation. And you say it's not your quote, but it is the title of a conversation that you have. It goes No one uh, comes undamaged from childhood and this was a conversation with a psychoanalogist and he goes it's not yours this sentence and you say that sentence belongs to who says it and then this reminds me of a film where um, Justino well uh, the character is telling someone off at the for using some a poem that is not his. And in fact, there's this sentence of Justino saying, poems belong to those who need them. And this sentence is all a bit of the same thing. You have that link very present, this relationship of the lack of verbality and these first images that are so important for you that you live in these kind of alternative museums, churches in Guatemala. Psychoanalysis is something that I find very interesting. And in France, there's a lot of being done on the basis of um, memory and what one remembers, which is also a construct. And I remember Matute's sentence that said, childhood lasts longer than life. Childhood is essential in the construction building of a human being. No matter, well, it doesn't really matter whether it was a good one or a bad one, but in any case, it will mark you. It will always mark you, and uh, you spend the rest of your life trying to deal with those pre-verbal experiences, and that's where my need comes, comes from. These, uh, for me, I want to create a sort of work, a piece of work, that, because this appears when you are born. You just there, you're brought to the world and you have no experience of it. And this lack or absence, in my case, that's uh, an absence or a, something that was lacking and that made me 
go searching for aesthetic experiences in Guatemala and in the churches that were there. And these churches have nothing to do with the churches you find in Europe. There's the, the indigenous the secrecy. And that is where, as a child, I found experiences that now, as an adult, I realize that they've been living within me for all this time, during all these years. And I've always been trying to go back to them in a way or another. I find it interesting when we start thinking about this, you know, in this conversation, this talk. Well, I find it interesting that you, you both refer to a sort of path, a sort of, a sort of journey that is calling for a, at least a mood that will help you or make you willing to open in to new channel, channels. So you sort of do your journey, travel in a way of guessing what you want to do, but you are in fact already within the game, which is in fact very much linked to your creation process. In John's case, you refer to this example when you went out to take pictures if you had bad weather or you didn't like the light, you started playing because you always carried a ball with you and used to play the Basque uh, ball game. And the, you said that you had both the uh, camera and the ball in different hands. Tell us about this game. This is a strategy game, in fact, because what was what you're looking for when you do that is to have your brain level go down so you're not so present. At the beginning, I suppose you've seen that, I'm an economist and my pictures at the beginning were pictures taken by uh, an economist who was learning about image. And one of the techniques I used to learn was that, to walk so I could feel that I was doing something that had nothing to do with the productivity of generating images. And also playing the Basque ball. In the Pyrenees and in the Basque country, uh, in each village there is a wall for the Basque ball and it's a sacred place, an empty space with a line drawn that will mark where you need to place the sphere above that line. And that is where the human being plays this game. And from the Basque point of view, but also in the US, you have this perspective of these, where you have to play the, place this sphere in that empty triadium. Isn't it beautiful? Who wants to take pictures if you can play the Basque Paul? These are very sculptural elements, so geographical elements, and such geographical elements, and it's linked to the ritual. And I was, you know, playing, and then using my camera with the left hand. And then you find the rhythm, and you see what Kandinsky got, and you think about it, and you feel alone when the light that is outside is something I don't like, or when I don't know how to interpret it. That's also interesting, because I also believe that photography, photographs and, and, pitch and images, in cases such as mine, in fact, become an interpretation of the light in places. Galerna is that, that's it for me. And for me, it's the interpretation of how the light is um, illuminating my house. And when I don't like the light or I don't know how to interpret it, I play the basketball or I, or I do other things. And today we heard about the importance of the body and 
This is, I found it very interesting because what I do in this series is I use my body and I inhabit this space in a very harmonious way and sometimes in a more violent way. And with the camera, I'm taking these images and there's a registry there that I haven't shown many people yet because I'm also working on some of my series in the very, very long term. I'd like to have Louise PowerPoint now because I'd like to share a video with you in relation to what uh, you're mentioning. He said, he, did, he did this, well, you did this gesture with the, with the left hand, you take pictures, with the right hand, you play. This is uh, literally how you use the two different uh, hemispheres and the body. And I'm really amazed by neuroscience. This is something I, I discovered many years ago. And I tried to go towards rationalism. It's uh, a path we use or a way we use to defend ourselves from emotions. As men, we have to do that. And I discovered that rationalism was making things difficult for me. And it was very simple. It was nearly maths. And then one day, I read the title of a book and an interview with Antonio, Antonio Damasio, a Portuguese neuro scientist who works in the US, and he's got a book entitled The Scarter's Mistake. And I thought, that sounds interesting. And he refers to this, and we're going to see it, this relationship of how we work with our hemispheres in our mind and our relationship to our Buddy. So in the world of neuroscience, many experiments are being carried out to analyze how we use rational intelligence, emotional intelligence, and how we, the relationship of all this with the body. And one of the exercises they have is that they put, they, they ask two people to walk, and one of them starts discussing a topic with a certain narrative and they walk and then suddenly he'll say how much is it when you multiply 12 by 8 and then they stop walking to give the answer so the optimization of the mind to send orders to the body comes from mechanisms that are very much linked to synergies what, to what we've learned to a certain reuse of orders that the body gives uh, on a regular basis. But when the mind makes the other part of the mind work, then the body has to stop. The body has to stop so that the mind can think. And you may laugh at that. What, you need to stop your body to let your mind think? But that the answer is yes. And why am I talking to the, about this? I'm going to refer to a series by Luis Mobius, and then we will come back to this one later, where I found this portrait, and we had it in an exhibition, and it's really big. And these are pieces of faces printed on rice paper. You remember that I was doing like this with this sheet of paper, and rice paper is even subtler. And Luis will refer to this, but this image is about the fragility of our identities. This is why he used rice paper. This is the element Luis chooses to make to, for the tools. You know, everything he uses is in his interventions have a meaning. And here, rice paper also has a meaning. So here, the different fragments are not well placed or correctly placed. And, and the position, they're linked only by the upper part. 
they're joined only by the upper part. I'm going to try and find the videos at the end. Quitan al final, ¿no? Lo que escuchamos. Luis, ¿me escuchas? Luis, can you hear me? Uh, SOS. Where is the video on Mobius? Is it at the very end of the PPT? Yes. Where we couldn't have you on the image and or project from my computer, and this is why got things got complicated. I think it's around here somewhere. No, it isn't. Bueno, lo. Sí, pero no. No hay problema. Lo lo cuento. Lo que ocurre. No problem. I'll just tell you about it. What did I do? Ah, oh, we've got Luis here. So, the pic, the, when we included this image in the exhibition in the Telefónica Foundation in 2015, well, yesterday that was just uh, the anniversary, six years, and you just walked by the image and then the pa rice paper moves as if it were breathing and our body and our relationship with the image generates something else and I thought that was really impressive it was amazing because it really reminded me of something that Antonio Damasio wrote where he says it's an example of how we remember the image of someone we love and he says, our memory doesn't keep, doesn't store the faces of the people we love as if they were Polaroids. He says that when our mind needs to remember a specific image of someone, of a loved one, the system demands information with, through a system with the strong interconnections that are neural interconnections and this goes to areas where we store sensorial effective uh, punctual data of the face and so on and the information all the the reconstruction of all these fragmented information is what allows us to reconstruct in our visual um, cortex an, a virtual image of that loved one. Luis didn't know about this, but I think he did a true reconstruction of this. I always mention the example of my grandmother, where, uh, well, I always remembered the smell of her hair. And this is something I'd have to represent in a fragment of some kind. But Luis did this description this this illustration in nearly a literal way of how you know this description of how our mind works through a very different process Disculpame. ¿Cómo llegas tú a esta imagen de Mobius? how did you get to that image in Mobius I totally agree with something you said so, for example, I want to try and get away from the idea of photography as something that is bi-dimensional. So I try to do something. I called it like that. I try to do an expanded photograph so that the image could become sm a smell, a space, a flavor, to get out of a traditional conceptual consumption or traditional concept of image. So it's called the skin. 
I decided to use rice paper because I felt that uh, really was very similar to the skin of the face. So the title is the skin of the face. And that's one of the formal aspects of this uh, decision. And then I also wanted to generate this image that would interact with the other in a silent way, in a very subtle way, where the other is affecting the image and the image is affecting you. And this is what in fact happens to all of us. So when the body got close to the image, it affected it. And seeing that effect, people were surprised. And the basic idea was that, to create some sort of skin that would be, in a symbolic way, close to a portrait. And they wanted it to have it have a conversation with the other in a subtle way. But all those fragments are sewn sometimes only in specific places with a red thread. It's not nylon, is it? It's some sort of wood, woolen thread, something that is very organic. So what's the meaning of that? It's a sort of circulating systems, but that are non-operative. The idea was to create a system that would be operational and non-operational at the same time, a circulating system. But then at the same time we see those threads fall at certain points. So that's the idea. This red thread gives cohesion to the image and then at the same time it gets lost. It's a sort of paradox of this element giving it cohesion and then getting lost. Can we go back to John's images? Because there is something else there. And I'd like to talk about how we show those pictures and so, what are those processes and how they uh, are linked to the body in a decisive, decisive way and sometimes in a conscious way? I don't know where it is. It's San Sebastian, but this is Luis. This is these are not your images. Can we have the other PowerPoint presentation, please? Now we will get. Mine, I suppose. Can you tell us in the meantime, if you remember, there was this exhibit and this image next to a map of the sea waves of the tides. So this idea of walking of playing. This is, idea is very much linked to the idea of mm, getting rid of something, of the mental thing, but also of the fact of being the author, that need of telling, I want to do, I want to say, because what I want to convey is, etc. This is the, something that is, in fact, very simple. I wanted to take pictures of how the sea was, mm, you know, going against the land or reaching the land. And I didn't like the images. And then at home, this was a mistake. And I suddenly saw all these images at a very small size. And when I looked at that, I thought, that's like the sea free breathing. It's like that breathing in the sea. And there are 210 images here, seven rows of 30 pictures. And these represents the breathing of the sea during six minutes, because I was taking pictures for six minutes from the very same spot. 
And this is what you see, these details, the rock, the water, reaching the rocks in a wave, and how this wave turns everything into white. And then at home, when I analyzed the resulting shape, I thought, well, you know, all these storms that are so much linked to the moon generate a mosaic of 208 images that also are also linked to the calendar of the year 2018. And of course, every year is calendar too. And this, it's what has already been said. The art, you, you, don't, you, you don't search, you're not looking for it, you don't find it, it just takes place. And I think this is a very clear example of this. And this is very much, very much related to what we said about the body. What is our relationship with this piece of art? As spectators, this is usually placed very far away from the door of entry to the exhibition. So the very first thing we see is this. And you feel curiosity, and this is why you want to come close to this, to look at the images when you see the water and the rocks and how the water covers the rocks and makes them become white and how they go away. And so this is, in fact, an unconscious representation of the tide, how it goes to the rock, stays for a while, caresses the land, and then goes back again and separates. This way of interacting with spectators is what is now becoming more important, in my view, in exhibitions, so that it is not uh, only a passive relationship. So when now back to Jan, when we're talking about this process, the creation process, Jan, sometimes you've all also shown how you separate yourself from that, that photographers do um, often because they want to share something. They go to the, out in this, to the streets and try, wait for the reality to show them, offer them something that will be related uh, to what they want to share. And that's not that easy. And then other people, what they want to share, when they want to share something, they generate it through games like the ones John did earlier and also the ones that you also do. And yeah, in this work, I basically introduce ferrous salt or iron. And well, one may think that, well, you do these things naturally, but well, I am doing this cyanorepia in at the beach, and there's, there's this. Let's explain what this is. Okay, I'm going to tell you where this comes from and the images. So basically, what you can see is a washi Japanese paper with a photosensitive solution on top. So if you put something on it, it works like a negative. The part that's exposed to the sun is blue, and the part that the object covers uh, is white, because it does not get the UV rays from the sun. All right? So this, you know, I'm at uh, the beach of La Concha in San Sebastián. And uh, yeah, tell us about the measurement, the dimensions of that paper. These are the small ones. It's 140 centimeters and uh, by 80 centimeters. So you're just holding a piece of paper in the beach. Yeah. <laughs> this paper, yeah, I'm, I'm not acting or faking. Yeah, actually, this is, you know, so photosensitive that all the fibers would open. It's like a Kleenex. This is just like a tissue, a wet tissue. It's super delicate. So I'm going to place this in layers and on plates that I hold with some with some um, pins. And what I do is that I get close to the sea and I plant this panel and I wait for the waves to come. And 
Yeah, before you were talking about this idea, and I will, you know, I'll place myself behind this kind of panel with such a delicate paper, and what I do is place sand here, and then I use the inclination and I allow the waves to to place some sand in the paper. And uh, so that the effect is like this, whenever there is sand, the sand is the object covering the paper and the, uh, the rays, the UV rays, um, don't cross, so it is white. So it's a kind of fight against the sea because I'm just in front of the sea with a certain body. And um, it is a, a ferrous type of cyanotypia that is resisting against another salt, which is the salt of the sea. And here we have the iron oxide because the cyanotype is oxidized and then it becomes red, like rust. And the paper is so delicate that this would be like the A side of the paper and the other side would be the B side of the paper. And it is marvelous because actually if you don't use the camera and if you just place yourself in front of the elements that you adore, you get these shapes which look like uh, mushrooms or fungi or or archipelagos. Actually, you're saying something beautiful, which is related to what you said previously. It's like just getting rid of that obsession of being the author and signing absolutely everything. Here, you're just letting the sea generate its own image. This is such a beautiful thing to say. It reminds me of Henry Fox in 1840-something, he just published a book, The Pencil of Nature. And uh, it talks about this. And just it talks about a moment in which, regarding Talbot letters, it says that it would be wonderful to let nature draw its own image. And it's this simultaneity, because from different places here, from different moments in life, well, you, you get different answers and you get different sensitivities. And that's why I remember that one year we were covering at the Wancho Triennial, we were covering the topic of simultaneity because something that had been deauthorized, I mean, the place of the second, right? The second who gets to the discovery. You know, it's, it's uh, you know, when you're second, you, somebody else has discovered something and you haven't. And this is so cruel, right? And, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's a hard blow to be the second. So I think that this reminds me of this kind of situation in which people from many different places and situations get to the same place and to, you know, and we can talk about simultaneity instead of talking of, of copies or plagiarism. And I think that now we will cover some part of this topic, but now talking again about getting rid of certain things, there is a process which in uh, the work of Luis González Palma that was mentioned at the beginning. It's this kind of bath of, of pewter where the body of Christ is eliminated, and in his work, in part of his work that we can appreciate in his PowerPoint, Luis, Luis, I guess that he's still not
Bueno, hay un, hay un fotógrafo de los más... Well, there's a photographer, one of the oldest photographers in Guatemala, Juan José Jesús Yaz, who is responsible of the iconography of the second half of the 19th century in Guatemala. And there are many pictures that he took in a studio, but also there's a lot of iconography from churches. And this is concentrated in the Filmotech of Guatemala, in a film where Luis faces again all these portraits, and he eliminates the subject of the portrait. And this comes at a time where Luis says that what he envisages with his personal work is to represent the nothing, the nothing, which is very close to that concept of the void, that Taoist concept of the void. It's not necessarily the absence of things because the void can be full, but there's a representation that we call the, vo the void, and this is more complex. And I would like Luis to tell us if there is this kind of uh, representation, this kind of link between his images and the void. And I would like him to tell us about that correspondence with uh, the Norwegian painter called Woods. Can you hear me, Alejandro? Yo hace más o menos 10 años que, que ya no tomo fotos. O sea, yo salgo a caminar. It's been 10 years since a, I do not take pictures anymore. Más, más nada, I mean, pensar, I go walking, eh, but I would just la idea de lo, go walking de lo, to, to think. ¿no? So the John, idea of what's eh, indeterminate, donde, no, of what John was sacó, talking ¿no? about, of uh, yo, yo pieza, ejemplo, doing pieces of work where the author is not there, is so que interesting. Que I am inspired mi, by the thinking bueno, of de, John Cage. I think he is my bridge. Is the one who directed all these kind of works. I, I decided to start working from archives, archives of my own work, but archives that I would find somewhere else, like in Cordoba or in Chirma, where there are different pieces of work. So the idea is to eliminate the portrait so I can leave the traces that are there on the plate. So it's like, you know, not having control. Just didn't have control in the sense that environmental factors, temperature or the wear or the tear or the wrong use of all those plates, there is so much information contained in the image about all of this, about the wrong use, about uh, the place where the plate was left, and all this information is so interesting to me. Because, well, the artist did something to those plates, but after that work made by the artist, there are some traces that remain in the plate. But it all comes from works that I didn't take the picture of. So it's like finding a world that is linked to our works, but at the same time, we have no relationship with it. And the idea of uh, relating this to the body of Christ, well, there's an idea here. The project started with that willingness to start synthesizing and uh, leaving something that gets closer to the void, to the nothing, but the nothing, the, the void, that is a void that contains a kind of fullness. 
or in the case of Munch's works, to eliminate and to leave only the works, the, the words, sorry, that he stroke and the stains that he generated, the ink stains that he generated. It's paradoxical. It's somehow relieving the word from the burden, but also when striking that word, uh, that word becomes an image. It becomes a kind of structure. So it's like I st I'm still working with images from photographies that are present in journals that he wrote. And uh, well, but you're ruling all this out. It's just like if you had some drawings, silent drawings. And somehow I believe that I did what the word couldn't say. Here I think I'm expressing something that the language does not express. I think that with visual art, the most important is what is not. And the same, I think, about psychoanalysis. The most important thing about psychoanalysis is what you do not say and the lapsus. And the same goes for the image. There is so much information that actually a lot is being said by not saying anything. And uh, you just need to rescue information and silences. Let me follow with that video. Luis, can you comment on this? These are called the bones of water. It's very much related with that need that we have to fix what's real. But here, we're talking about the frustration, the impossibility to get the same image because life goes by. And even though we have the illusion that with the photography we capture things, this tells us actually that it's like, you know, certain things that happen in nature, you just notice them. You notice them, but that's it. At the end of the day, you just have some traces. And those traces will become little pieces, little sculptures, if you want, because this is made from little branches. These traces in the drawing, I duplicate them with branches when they're green. And if I, leave the, if I let them dry, they take the shape of the drawing. So this is something that is determined by nature. And it's called the bones of water because obviously if it had not rained, we would not have this kind of solid water with the branch. Again, we go back to simultaneity. This remind me immediately the myth of Sisyphus carrying the rock to the summit and then the rock falls and once and again he starts and you want to fix this kind of constant movement and it shows the impossibility. And there is such a beautiful video as well from Oscar Rowe, a Colombian artist, he uses a bowl of water and he paints uh, with 
a brush, his own portrait, and uh, but the rock, he paints that on a stone, on the rock, but the rock is hit by the sun, so he just paints this with the brush, with water, but because of the exposure to the sun, water evaporates, so he still has to draw his portrait again and again. And this is a way to say that he's defining his identity. So you have continuously been working on the topic of identity. You've been working the topic of identity since the very beginning, but also something that you did, like Jon, was using the boxes of the daguerreotypes in your work. We're sorry, we're having trouble to hear the moderator. Yeah, but I could hear. And now? Now it's much better. John was talking about processes that correspond to the beginning of photography. You also used many different techniques and uh, processes with daguerreotypes and boxes of daguerreotypes. You've also incorporated contemporarily visors for stereoscopic photography. So you've used antique techniques, ancient techniques, but you want to somehow leave photography a little bit aside and uh, you have been deploying many different tools and uh, there is something so complex, like representation or the look upon something, and you're using those tools. And uh, I'm trying to think what kind of relationship there is with all this. In other words, why have you been using so many ancient techniques for photography? Techniques that are even much, much older like the techniques with all those aptroptic cylinders. You know, Alejandro, formally speaking, the way in which you approach an image or an object, depending on the material this object has, will be different. I mean, the same idea printed in rice paper or in glass will make the image be con contemplated in a different way. So I use that very much. And I reflect on the material and technique that would be the most relevant so that it contains an entire policy or an entire ideology that will be present in the work. So the range that I have, the range of materials that I have, is very important because the history of photography is full of techniques that keep changing. And right now, with technology, there's also possibility to print on materials uh, that it was impossible to print before, so I try to be as free as possible to look at the relationship between the material and the image, because this is something that I find fascinating. Yeah, the microphone, please. You have to use the microphone. We've got five minutes left. Life is eternal. Actually, 
Well, I wanted to keep talking about landscape and the relationship that you had with landscape, John, spiritual relationship with landscape. And actually, while we're talking about the first definition that is given about landscape, and uh, it comes from many centuries ago, and it says that landscape tends to be spiritual. And this is related to how certain cultures undertake the representation of that. And there's a very good friend, a Chinese artist, who used to talk about this willingness to emancipate his work from his cultural roots, his roots of origin. And he says that one of his professors in Wu Wanchong at the Faculty of Fine Arts said that artists are like comets. They move in the air with liberty, with freedom, but they always have a thread that keeps it connected to, to the earth, to their tradition, to culture. And uh, this Chinese artist told me, I want to cut that thread. And I've always told him that it was not possible. You will always have that connection. And I was talking about this to Luis the other day, and he said, well, maybe not cutting the thread, but <laughs> I think Luis is frozen. Yeah, but can you, can you cut that thread? No. No, but you can get it more loose. But the alternative for me would be to cut it. But you can't. Well, cut it or let it loose. All right, so letting it loose. This is like a loop, right? Well, anyway, we haven't got much time. I would like to say a couple of things with regards to Luis and to John, two things that happened when I was look when I was you know when I've been interviewing them and everything and they do something that is not so usual they keep thanking people who have been listening to them I mean they keep being grateful whenever you propose something. And this way of getting into a dialogue, of just talking about their work by thanking, I think that this is something that is very human, but sometimes nobody will say thanks. And I think that this is the essence that helps us understand. As Camille was saying this morning, or we were saying the other day that what's important about a dialogue is to truly say something. So with both of you, this dialogue is very easy because you have this honesty. So I do thank you so much for taking part in this conversation. And I hope that you all enjoyed it. No es, no es nada evidente esta, estas conexiones ¿no? que, que supuestamente nos hemos acostumbrado a ellas. Estas conexiones no son tan fáciles, ¿verdad? A veces, bueno, este año hemos estado acostumbrados a conectarnos remotamente. Y este año, bueno, este año solo queríamos tener a todos en persona, in person, pero bueno, well, la vida es la vida y todavía estamos in the pandemic, and this conversation is a reflection of the world in which we live, so that's why we were remotely connecting. And as Frank was saying this morning, we're having this 
conversations and disconnections, but at the same time, these disruptions and dissonances that may interrupt us when we try to go a bit more in depth. What was important for us, well, for me, it was very important to count on this presentation, this work by two great artists that help us understand the complexity and uh, the idea of feeding on many different elements so that we can build these universes. Well, if you have any questions, but if it's not the case, thank you again. We're now going to take 10 minutes so that we can start at 30 past, half past. I know that we're running a little bit late and we will then uh, give the floor to Camille Toledo for the final conference. He will not be here with us. The conversation will take place through Zoom, but we know that we will feel like he is with us. Give us 10 minutes so that we can, we can solve the technicalities. Thank you very much, Luis, for being with us from Argentina. Thank you, John, as well. Thank you, Alejandro.
Bueno. Deux minutes. Rien, Ça va aller. Bueno, vamos a, a arrancar con... ¿Qué ha desaparecido? Ok, on y va. Bueno, vamos a arrancar eh, con esta última sesión. All right, we're going to start with the last session. Bueno, sentimos que estamos todos en una en esta de, desorganización. We're sorry because we're all in this pandémica, ¿no? kind of desorganization. De, de y de I think that we all are willing to 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 conversate and to to talk and to share. And sometimes, well, it's not so seamless as we wish. I would like to. Close this day with this conference, and I just wanted to have one single speaker, Camillo de Toledo. He's a journalist, and uh, he's a writer, and he reflects this multiplicity of disciplines when constructing a way of thinking and a discourse. De los, eh, al Prix and actually he's been selected for the Prix Goncourt with his last novel and actually to me his way of thinking and uh, is so relevant nowadays and it is so clear because it helps us understand the way we live nowadays and to me it was fundamental to listen to him to close this day about the role of the artist and the creator nowadays. Because for me, Camille is this kind of firefly. He's just a light who is among us, and I'm sure that he will give us lots of clues. I always think that he is the light to follow. Thank you very much, Camille, for being here. With this physical distance, there's a screen that separates us, but we hope that we will give you back the magic. 
and uh, you were already in Menorca and I hope that you will be able to tell us what you feel Camille, tu m'entends Oui, moi aussi, j'ai la traduction en anglais. Tu n'as pas, pas allumé ton, pas ton, 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 ton streaming de tout à l'heure Non, j'ai le, le son en anglais, donc c'est un peu complexe pour parler. Euh, je peux, en tout cas, je merci infiniment, Sandra, pour tes... Pero porque se oye. No, j'ai vraiment seulement, seulement mon micro qui est allumé. Tu as tout éteint. Pero porque se oye. Ça se oyait en retraso, mi voz, además. J'ai un grand, grand décalage, mais si, oui. si de votre côté ça convient, si vous m'entendez, là maintenant, oui. Juste peut-être un petit signe, je peux juste qu'on fasse un petit signe de, pour me dire si la parole. Euh, well, there's, bien. yes, there's indeed a, a, quite a big delay. Je vais, euh, je vous remercie infiniment. I would like to thank you. I am so sorry that I cannot make it to Menorca. I couldn't make it and I can't be with you. I would like to go back to what's been said, uh, which has been beautiful. And what I heard is that you were talking about this topic of pr fragility and images and interrogation with the links uh, with the world. And um, I heard the name of an author, and I would like to start from there. In the previous conference, we were talking about Antonio Damaso, and I would like to go back to his writings to tell you about his technique as well, which is about starting from the structure of the brain. And this is related to what I would call the wound. So the wound. Because the brain has this capacity, the human brain has this prodigious capacity to project in languages and codes and to translate abstractions. And I think you know, when I heard my predecessors that we had uh, the idea from what we know from the structure of the brain of a wound, a general wound that is related to the place where we live and the way that we live. It's just as if the structure of the brain could be related to our senses, to our affects. Now we have lost the sound. I'm very sorry. We cannot continue. We have lost the sound. We can't hear what Camille de Toledo is telling us. Now we can again. And something in which I worked a lot in recent years it's what we talk Anthropocene. It is this kind of terrestrial crisis, this bioclimatic crisis between forms of human life which live in certain manage under certain language and the sensitiveness and uh, the links, the bodily links that are sensitive to other ways of living and to other vegetable ways. And it's just as if the middle of the wound, that wound that we have to live in, because it's just as if we were meant to live in the middle of that wound. And 
That wound is embedded in the structure of a sapiens brain. And actually, I'm going to refer to the sapiens narrens because the sapiens narrens is the kind of species that can provide a certain narrative, a narration or a fiction if you want. Well, again, to go back to the wound, it's just as if the wound in the brain had affected the entire world and had recovered the form in which we live, in which we inhabit the world. It's, to make it a bit more specific in your in, in your mind, this wound in which I work is at the core of the conversation that we had previously, that we heard previously. And this wound would represent the figure of the algorithm. It is a human life that is tied to an algorithm. So the capacity to express language which will go very much in depth. And it's a way to think uh, about this language, about this abstract, this mathematical language, and how it is conceived and how it is related to this sensitive ways of inhabiting, this incarnated ways of inhabiting. We could take another example between the strong powers of the market, the abstractions of the market, the flows, countable flows, and the flows of figures, and the conflict and the wound that is related to the slow character of bodies, the, the, the momentum of characters, and uh, the sensitiveness between that and time, human time, working time. It's just as if this site of wound and this site of separation and pushing back and forth, it's just as if this site or this spot, if you want, would never stop getting larger and aggravating. Now, why do I talk about this figure of the wound? Well, basically, because sometimes, uh, since I am a photographer, and since I am very much committed in different manners, artistically, for example, well, very often I'm pushed to wonder what art does and what's the purpose of art and what is its role and how can it interfere and i'm talking here about an art in the large sense of the word which would encompass visual arts installation arts writing poetry and i could even include Sciences, sciences that remind our body of its attachments and uh, I'm talking as well about historical knowledge, psychoanalytical knowledge, knowledge by ethologues uh, who are observing uh, animal behavior and uh, botanists and uh, mesology, which is the knowledge of relationships, of a way of life, of ecosystems. So finally, so it's about this relationship between art and the wound. And now I will... Yes, there's a very long delay with the translation in English. Don't worry about it. And so this was my starting point. I wanted to talk about this time of wounds and my philosophy and the different logics, the abstract logics and logics that are accelerating, that inflict a kind of violence to sensitive life, to temporality, and not only of human lives, but the world. 
So that's how I try to understand this um, place of art. This is a place where we come, remind the wound and the sensitive life. In the in comparison to these big abstractions that, as I was saying, come from the heart of our brains, and art is mobilized, it mobilizes the sensitive link. It's like as if art came to repair and cure this wound. And this is what I also heard in the previous conference. And it's a bit about where I'm working and how I work. And on the basis of this wood, I would like to widen the diagnosis of our current times. I have a quest with my different artistic tools, with the mapping, to see where we are at. We have this very long human history, and I try to understand where we are at at the beginning of the 21st century. And so, I'd from there, I have this vision of the abstraction plan and then the sensitive plan, and finally, an effort to try and create a link between the abstraction plan, the abstraction force that creates violence, and the sensitive plan. I'd like to widen on this diagnosis of the wound on the basis of this. I've talked about Anthropocene, Anthropocene and the climate, climate issue and how this a way of inhabit the wound is to remember how the evil the way we uh, we are using up the earth comes to this capacity of abstraction and acceleration of flows, merchandises, and so on. And the artist should place it himself them, themselves in this wound, in this gap. So. A first diagnosis is this collective effort of artists and human sciences is to rework and try to remind us all of the long times, the long period of periods of times of ecosystems like hundreds of years the life of plants that go beyond our look to try to remind us of other uh, temporalities. A different time of this diagnosis on the current times, and this has taken uh, I've been working on this for many years, is this mm, moment of the end of the 20th century, this moment of change towards the new century, so to un try and understand what happened in the previous century. And there we're going to face the issue of the tra traumas of history, wounds of history, this par disappearances, and also the ecological topic of the destruction of ecosystems. And following this image of the wound, I try to understand what has happened between languages and the world, between the way we have seen 
understood life and the sensitive life, the family life, the emotional life, what happened there. And in this sense, on that level, I also carry out this diagnosis on the basis of the wound of history bringing a up a lot of phantoms, of specters, the presence in the present of forms of life that have been destroyed. And this brings me to photography, this art that is actually grasping from the past these forms of life that have sometimes been destroyed or disqualified. So, we have the ecological issue that is linked to this issue of the memory and the spectrality. And now I'd like to add a third moment of this present time which is for me more looking towards the future, but which poses the same issues on the basis of the wound. And that's hope, what I call hope. And I've been working so much on this issue of hope on the basis of a philosopher, Ernst Loch, who worked on the principle of hope. What is hope in a moment with violences and tensions? And there we face a problem because hope is a narrative that breaks through, that gets rid of the present of life and projects itself towards a future time. And therefore, in some way, it can even make the wound worse. Is, is, the, is the utopia what we call utopia in the past? This abstraction of this place without a place, utopos, that something that is going to project us to another time, but the result of which will threaten the fragility of life. So here we see how and to which degree our sapiens brain produces narratives that are violent towards the fragility of life, including under the name of hope. So the artistic questions, the work is there. On the basis of this diagnosis, so from which the artist and the writer will be able to testify. So what are the gestures that he'll be able to make in order not to add evil to the evil, to be on, on the side of wood, on the good, and try to work on the fragility of life and try to understand the present time. I'm going to I'm try and share my screen. And I'd like to show you different languages and experiences, propositions that I've been working on and producing during many years and to follow this common idea of the wound and see how this links us and brings us together with uh, sensitivity.
Donc vous devez voir euh, une des une des installations. So this is one of the installations, one of my pieces that I presented in Leipzig many years ago. Voilà. And it shows this space covered by leaves, these fallen leaves of the autumn I, that I collected. And the fire that is showing in German Heimand, this um, fireplace how we can rethink this idea of um, dwelling, how we inhabit, inhabit in a less violent way, in a less predatory way. And here I was also talking about the Anthropocene, Anthropocene and how we can make an echo of current the violences towards the issue of identity and these human narratives that are dividing and having this fireplace was questioning or asking about homes and inhabitation Groikos, this is echoes. This is the this Greek term that comes from ecology, economy. Everything is linked to this issue of how we inhabit things. And this joining of the forms of inhabiting the different types of dwellings we've had since the Neolithic times from the beginning of sedentary um, habit, uh, customs where we've had all these ways of inhabiting with regards to the ecosystems and the different forms of appropriation, exploitation of the rivers, of the water, of well, the cultures. We see how the way in which humans inhabit are marked by forms of violence. So we see that here in this um, work of art with this broken mirror to the left and all these branches that seem to be beans and this al alphabet which alphabet shall we use in the future to write? How can we change language? How can we change the way in which we talk about the world and we inhabit the world through language? And always in these images, this light with the word hope, in espoir in French, which is finally a question that is being asked to the future narratives. How are, going to, are we going to work on future narratives in order to inhabit in a different way, to live differently? Here in these images, there is a, a dimension that is very dear to me, and that is the archaic dimension. It's not nothing pejorative. It's Archaic is what creates a dialogue with modernity. Modernity has saturated us with different forms of entertainment and has made us go away from more archaic forms like loving, feeding, inhabiting, loving, and now the archaic questions are re-asked again. They're coming from the inside of modernity. They're coming strongly from the inside of modernity to question us. And this is the first image I wanted to share with you. 
And I'm going to be trying and speed up. I'm sorry for that, but I'd like to share with you another image. On the left, you see, and this was in the same installation, you see all these uh, sleeping bags. So people could sleep in the installations, and we have these animal shapes, and we have the letters there with the word dystopia in this neon light. And this was this moment of wood, of wound that we had to live. And this was held between the dystopia and the utopia. So the big question was how are we going to re inhabit the present? How can we find ways of dwelling, of inhabiting that are different? And this is a way of being careful. This is a presence to our sensitivity to others, a policy of presence and of those present, for those who are present. I'd like to comment on, well, a different form. This is a, we've seen this exhibition that I had in Leipzig some time ago, and now I'm going to stop sharing my screen. And I would like to show you a different dimension of the work always with this thread of the wounds that we sapiens inflict on the world. So, as you can see, this is an image of a river a very wide river. It's an enormous river that marks the fracture of the French territory and is marking also this fracture with the Danube that is going through Europe. This is the line of the that breaks the territory. So it's the north and the south with regards to the Danube in Europe and with regards to the lawyer in France. So this river in France, here we see it's the pages of a book, but a book that is the continuity of a narrative functional work to try and change the conditions of this inhabiting. How can we change the forms and writings of our human uh, dwelling in the natural ecosystems? I want to show you some other images of this work, and this is the book. So this is the image I wanted to show you. This is the a human assembly. And this is a human concern for the world and the earth. And here we see Bruno Latour, the philosopher, this French philosopher who worked a lot on the topic of the Anthropocene and the bioclimatic bio crisis. And we also see Frédéric Aiguatic, um, an artist, researcher, and nature historian. And together, 
Reno, Latour, and Frederick have been searching theater forms to try to get bring into the theater Gaia, the earth, through the forests and the rivers. In Latin America, we talk about the Pachamama and how the earth becomes a character on our stages, on the stages of the theater, but also the stages of politics. And the work we do on the lawyer is inspired by different laws and legal reforms in New Zealand, Colombia, Canada, the US, Equator, Australia, in several islands in the Pacific. And these laws and legal reforms will are giving rights, awarding rights to the natural species, both flora and fauna, and plant and animal species that are acknowledged the new rights. And these laws create new legal fictions that are new ways of writing law. And these new writings propose to turn these ecosystems, these environments, and places into legal entities. And this, in the future, soon enough, will mean that environments and ecosystems will be able to participate in the collective discussions and defend themselves in court. So this is um, legal rebellion, a legal revolt. So it's the natural elements that will become stakeholders and legal subjects, legal entities. So in this artistic work that was an artistic, legal, political work, it's a sort of school for the future to try and reflect and think in a collective way on these new laws to see how they can be adapted and how we can make them possible in our European societies, in our environments, so that we can give them a voice and rights, and we can use the legal language when we refer to natural elements. This work is on right where the wound is. And now I will stop sharing my screen for a minute. So what we tried to do was change the writings. That's the writing plan. And then we would have on the world here. And the idea is to change the writings to trying to create links to the world to think about the conditions of our habitat uh, in a different way so that the world can stand up and have a dialogue, negotiate with us, so that we can create a relationship there, so that the river can negotiate and vote against a development project or oppose a, st a state so that natural elements become stakeholders and actors of the collective life. So this is a link of the wound and the encoding on one side and life on the other side.
Je vais maintenant vous parler d'une autre forme. So, I'd like to talk about another form or another shape. I'm sorry that I cannot be in Spain, and I hope it will soon be in Spain in Spanish. And here we have the text translated into Spanish by Roberto Juan Cantabella, a translator and writer that I appreciate much. And this is a book entitled in French, Essai, Sa Vie Nouvelle. And it shows the links between the text and the picture, the photographs, the text and the documents. So we have this phantom from the past, this ghost. And here in the structure of the page, we see that the text, the code, is trying to find the matter, to get out of the language, the alphabet, to try and find the body, the body of the person disappeared. So this text tries on the basis of wound, so always to start uh, from the wound of this that has is missing of its absence, everything that has been wounded, and the language tries to relive from that wound from that that is that absence so here we have these wounds of history these are wounds of the 21st century a uh, the 20th sorry century where we had the first world war the second world war and that moment of economic growth where that economic growth seemed to offer prosperity and abundance, and now we are aware of the fact that this prosperity it was in fact provoking and implying the crisis of the earth. And I wanted to briefly show you how in the text of literature, in this work, we have many writers and poets to try and create a link of towards the body, the wound, the affections, the those who are have disappeared and are missing. And here on this page, you can see. A handwriting of someone from the past who left this um, testimony and who wrote this before he committed suicide and left this text as an inheritance, as a legacy. And once again, we question we are considering again the question of the inheritance and what we want to inherit, inherit in terms of, well, to be remembered forever, not a, quite that, but this inheritance we live in for life. So the question would be, what is the history we'd like to write beyond that of those who have disappeared of the forms of life that have been destroyed. That is for me the question, the poetic question, and also poetic emotional question at the heart of our times. Et j'aurai une dernière 
And I have a final proposition for you, and that will be the end of my presentation. I know you have many other things you're going to do this evening, and I'd like to share with you for the, la the screen again, and something I want to share with you to try and tell you how I understand this articulation between the past and the destructions we inherit. The present between hope and despair in the one we are, we live today, and also the question of the future, the hopes, the narratives that need to be relaunched. So now a few words of what you see in the screen. You can see what I call, and actually I've just finished this creation, you will see what I call the investigation room. Because the investigation is, for me, one of the ways to join art and history and the present and the different human sciences for 30, 40 years. And now, with, with this, I have tried to materialize this and to, to, to make it something like the time of questions, uh, the questions that we have to wonder about, the questions that we need to think about at the beginning of the 21st century. And one of the questions, of course, is how did we get there? And what made us be here? So why are we destroyed? And what do you think about those who were destroyed? And, and you know, these are the results of this investigation. And this is the art of investigation. This is a way to show the delay or the gap between fiction and bodies and the matter of the world. Fiction, for instance, fiction in uh, narration about technical progress or economic growth or the ideal of certain political encodings. It's, you know, the investigation entails that we place ourselves at the very core of the wound and uh, we are placed again in the middle of different narratives that will uh, take us far from the, from the body. And uh, it will place us uh, away from all of this. It's like a kind of drug or a capsule that will keep us away from this wound. And then there's the reality. And with this investigation, and to me, it, it's a way to have a dialogue with this kind of writing. You know the way sapiens used to write in their caves in order to give a testimonial of their own presence, in order to prove their presence. And to me, this kind of investigation is also a way to prove where we are now. And we are this species that is, from a narrative point of view, that is curious and that wants to change the way of this, of this habitat so that the wound is less painful, so that there is less of a wound. I, I could show you some more images where we find the image of the missing this missing ancestor which passed away before the end of Second World War. Here we see in this double image, in this double picture, we see some excerpts, some 
different sides in the investigation room and there's in the right hand in the left hand side there's the impact of the atomic bomb and in the right hand side there's a question that talks about this human chemistry which will endanger the chemistry of our bodies but also the chemistry of the entire earth it's somehow a way of decoupling this profound solidarity between our bodies, the history of our bodies and the history of the earth and the matter of the earth. It's just as if the body was a place of reflection, of encounter between the matters that compose the earth and the matters that have animated human beings and our bodies. And also, there's this image of the bomb, the bomb in our personal history, a bomb that actually really um, struck my, my father and, and changed the entire imagery of the Second World War. So actually, still talking about the thread of the wound, these led to the difficulties and this led to the Europe in which we are nowadays. And uh, it's a way to propose some narration that is not apocalyptic. It's just as if we were using poetry or art or fiction, but also the re-encounter with the world, uh, even though we need to extract ourselves from these fictions, from these imageries. You see here, you see this last images which are scans of uh, and x-rays of uh, the inside of a body, of a human body. It's just as if the human body was keeping trace and engraving all these shocks and wounds. I'm going to stop sharing my screen here. And actually, I'm going to leave it here. I would just like to tell you, to finish, that still, within this idea of trying to make a diagnosis of our presence, of our current times. And to me, this is a kind of, it's, it's a, the, somehow the fear that art entails. What can art do? What can literature do? What can it do in front of such strong currents, such strong winds that are so dark and that are at the heart of history. I really like Walter Benjamin and I like his notion, the notion that he's been working in his thesis on history. Well, he talks about the archives of the future. Now, how to leave archives for the future? I think, you know, I think the role of art is immense. And at the same time, it is small, it is tiny, because there are today such strong forces, like nationalistic forces, which try to find ways to trade off or to consolation ways from a territorial point of view. There are other forces from the Anthropocene that are going to devastate with, with the logics of climate engineering, with the idea of going still further away in models of growth. And art is 
at this place of fragility and uh, art somehow keeps this archive alive, this archive of fragility, this archive of a life that is wounded. And we would so much like, in the name of this life, we would so much like to try to, try to make from all the politics one policy, the policy of this fragility. Okay, and I will leave it here. I think and I hope that it was clear enough. And to me, yeah, it was it was difficult. I was trying to speak slowly because I was receiving the the delayed voice of the translation, so I hope that I was clear enough in French and I know that this is an extraordinary work that's being done in terms of interpretation and translation so that we can try to convey the message. Thank you very much. And thank you very much for your consideration. And thank you for your readings. And I'll be uh, available if you still wish and have the patience to ask questions or Otherwise, I would like to wish you a very fruitful event. And that's it. Thank you very much, Mr. Camille, for your consideration towards our work. Thanks a lot. Merci infiniment, Camille. Thank you. Thank you so much, Camille. We're sorry that we couldn't have you here with us, with your, your body full of matter. There was this also this kind of wound with the screen that was splitting us. But, well, we hope that someday we will reconduct the situation and that we will be able to have this kind of link. Anyway, you were talking about so many things and uh, this relationship with all these different links and different elements that lead us to different places and the idea of the body and the idea of this reality and how to dialogue from one step to another, to dialogue, not only with our peers, but with everything that surrounds us. And I think that you're so good at making this link relevant. And, you know, for this edition that is so particular, for this edition that is so special in 2021, now I will now move to Spanish and I will say that in order to close this conference, I think that this conference is so good because it really ties us with what is awaiting us. This is the evening that's awaiting us. We will now bring our speakers to the island of Lazareto, the island of pandemics, so that we will enjoy a performance and a small adapted choreography the dream stealer, the, the dream thief. And uh, actually, this is what Camille was talking about, about life and death and this place of encounter. Thank you very much, Camille. Thank you very much to all of you as well for this patience. And thank you for bearing with us in this reality that we cannot live without pain, with this wound that we have. We hope that we will try to mitigate this wound tomorrow on Sunday, and I will wait for you at half past nine. Thank you very much.